Hello and welcome to day 13 of Bon Samba. Today we will be uh, covering uh, The Spy Who Loved Me, which is actually a good Roger Moore film. My name is Tom. Yeah, I'm Joe. <laughs> oh god, this is so much better. <laughs> yeah, it's, <sighs> it's like this movie, you know, watching it in marathon, like this movie feels good, like immediately. It's like, like oh. It, <laughs> yeah, I, I have to confess, with um, with this I I watched them back to back, and it was like uh, the the palpable relief when we get that that scene with the nuclear sub the submarines being nicked, and it's like, oh my god, it's a competent film. Oh thank god! Yeah. Oh my god, this is suspenseful, and oh, we we've got this excellent ski chase and oh we've got this introducer of, of, of like a real foil for Bond in the shape of yeah. uh, Anya I'm going to try and pronounce it Anya Asimova at all, aka Triple X uh, Agent Triple X Triple X <laughs> and it's like and it, it, the, the, it's like oh oh that's so much better thank you <laughs> thank you so much thank yeah. you so much I, I had to tell you like it gets better immediately yeah it's like it's like i i i understand i mean i know it sucks like talking to two people who agree with each other talking film all the time but it's just like uh oh, yeah oh, I, it's so much better <laughs> and it's like yeah. and and the thing is it waits you know you know how like bloody man with the golden gun takes like forever to get started it's like yeah here are two submarines being stolen who could be stealing these submarines Let's go to Bond. Bond is going to be escaping from the Soviets in Austria in this incredible chase and um, skydive, which is like, holy shit, which I think at one point was, you know, a Guinness World holder in terms of the highest yeah. jump ever shot on film. And it was a miracle they got that. Mm. And it, it was just a force of luck because the person who skydived, and they literally credit him in the cigarette sequence as the guy who fucking did this yeah. he was worth being in the opening credits yeah, it of is this film absolutely jaw-dropping and it's like yeah it's like that and, is how um, you open a bond film you go here is what is happening something is happening here is bond bond is now going to do this fucking amazing thing which we're going to obviously put in the opening sequence and probably in the flipping trailer as well because it looks amazing yeah and it's yeah like, and, um and you know, they did the stunt straight up. It's practical. Mm, it's... And uh, the cameras that were trying to catch up, they were trying to get multiple cameras. Only one camera did, which is why you have the straight unbroken shot, which is, yeah. it is an incredible. Oh, and God, they got yeah. the shot you wanted because there was even the point where he kicked off the skis and, you and can the see skis them hit his parachute. Oh. And there was the worry that the uh, parachute was going to be broken mm. or you know, damaged in some way because of the ski. Yeah. But, you know, they got everything. Yeah. And it is a fanta fantastic yeah. shot, one of the best in James Bond history. Mm. Yeah, it's... And, yeah. And, and the thing is, the film stays on that level. Yeah. It stays um, on that level. It goes, okay, right. Now we're going right. to do some more fun stuff. And it's like and we are going to go to, you know, a really fascinating place, Egypt. Yep. I mean, it's kind of the tourist version of Egypt yeah. as it starts out. Like they literally one of the sequences literally happens at like a tour st stop of the uh, mm. pyramids. And, uh, you know, but they make interesting use of the location yeah. like <laughs> to almost a fault. I hopefully the uh, Q branch they have in uh, Egypt was a set and not an authentic location because they are actually using, uh, you know, uh, archaeological dig sites as a secret lab for Q branch yeah. and wrecking stuff. <laughs> and the the part of me that was a, a six that went through an Egyptologist phase in sixth grade is not comfortable with this. That, that belongs in a museum. Yes, it, yes, it does. And, it, it, it's, and then you have obviously. So, yeah, Anya is an amazing Bond character. Like, yeah, it's it's really refreshing to go from Goodnight, who is a complete 
dunce. And I, and I hate to keep calling her a dunce, but she is like played as the stupidest character yeah. in the entire Bond series. To yeah, this this woman is is, is a match for Bond. Yeah, she is Bond's equal. Yeah. So. <sighs> and it's like oh. Oh my god, you know how to write female characters again. Excellent. And then we have probably the best henchman in, in Bond. Uh, Jaws. <laughs> Fucking hell. Yeah, so Jaws is a really odd thing in the Bond series, which is a recurring, um, hench Villain. recurring henchman. And it's like, he's in two films, and he's, he's in this, and Moonraker, and it's like, he's obviously this, you know, this henchman for hire. And Richard mm -hmm. Keel is just—he he is huge. excellent in this film. Yeah, he, and he is a you know enormous <laughs> presence normally. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. Uh, but he also has like you know this face and the screen presence that you know hasn't been used mm. properly because he was used in a lot of films as like, but he was mostly used in B films like as to be the monster in the costume yeah. or. He was like a caveman or something mm. like that. Like he didn't get to, you know, fully be a villain, which it it's weird to say he's like developed, but mm. he's developed. Because he is a he is he doesn't say anything. No. He, he says he has, one line in two films, which we'll obviously yeah. get onto when we come back. But the amount of acting he does with just his face and obviously his physical appearance is damn. Yeah. This is like it, a, a. He is a silent film villain in the seventies, but it really works. Hmm. Yeah, and it's like he and obviously behind the scenes, obviously Richard Keel had to have these dentures put in, which really actually hurt his his mouth. So they actually, yeah. because they, they were they were meant to be razor sharp, and it's like yeah, you can't really put razor sharp stuff in a man's mouth. No. And he could only have them in, I think, in about for about a minute on shot. So you obviously, for a lot of the film, his um, his mouth is closed, and obviously, and then you get his like physical, you know, how he he just because he, he just destroys stuff. He, he, at mm. one point, he punches a hole in a van, and it's like, yeah, okay. And it's because Rich, he's Richard Kill. You buy it. Yeah, you 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 buy he because he's so big, and it's like. And then you actually have almost as an afterthought, um, Carl Stromberg, who is a a really yeah. fun again, a really he's very much sort of back to after you know two really underwhelming villains. He's back to the the big old megalomaniac trying to take over or destroy the world. In this case, yeah. he's trying to start World War Three by taking all these nuclear subs and basically making them fire at. Um, obviously Moscow and New York to start World War Three, from which he will go in his secret underwater base to go, right, that's fine human. And he will create a new you know, race of civilization mm. under the sea. Yes. This will, this will be a recurring thing in the next film. Yeah. yeah. The, <laughs> the Lewis Gilbert movies. The Lewis like, Gilbert. He did a couple ones and they're kind of sort of the same movie. They are, they are the same movie. <laughs> they are, the, and it's like and it's quite, it's I, the, the, the thing I like about this film is it feels like it captures that perfect sort of sweet spot between serious Bond and fun Bond, because it is, in places this is a very fun film. And it's like... It is a very fun fun film but it doesn't lose mm -hmm. like track of this has to be dangerous like mm -hmm. um this has one of the i mean there's a henchman that is under jaws mm -hmm. that is doesn't last in the movie very long he's just this he's just a bald baddie and they don't say much but um in cairo they have a he has a fight on a rooftop and and there is no music it is just you know kind of a tense they're kind of on mm. the edge of a rooftop and you know they're trying to knock each other off and it's it's a very well mm. done dangerous you know fight mm. sequence and it's it's like okay you know it's and it's in this movie that is you know huge it has giant implications it has you know underwater base it has a lotus that turns into a submarine but it still has that this mm. 
feel like there's danger and there's, it's not too far out hmm. that it's just kind of a mockery of itself. No, and it certainly does. What it does, and it's actually quite surprising that this is like in the mid seventies. Obviously, in the mid seventies, you did have a thawing to a degree of you know the Cold War before, obviously, the beginning of the eighties. It's a remarkable sort of you know amount of let's cooperate because yeah, this guy is going to try and destroy the world, and we kind of like being in the world. <laughs> and it's like you obviously get the the um, the basic the team up between obviously Anna and Bond, but you also get this this sort of sequence later in the film where you get the US, the UK, and the Russian crews, obviously all of who have had their submarines stolen to. Uh, to sort of go right. We've got to take back the submarine, or this guy is going to start World War Three. And it's like, okay, yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah. And it feels like, um, you know, it doesn't feel like it's stretching too much. Hmm. I mean, it's just it's the first part of the movie is kind of a trail, like, oh, there's this path of clues we need to follow, hmm. and Jaws is trying to kill everybody who has the clues. <laughs> And they're trying to, you know, find the people and get the clues before they die. Um, and then they get, you know, chased by Jaws, which, you know, it's its own thing. But it's the scenes have their own energy and they have their own momentum and it keeps hmm. going. And they keep have and they use their locations well, like they use Cairo well, they use Egypt well. They, um, you know, I think the only even when they have an obviously, you know, backlit thing uh, or, you know, back screen of uh you know the you uh, the nile mm. it's used it well, looks fine yeah like, absolutely it has flavor and character mm. and that's the thing it, it it has it feels honestly like you know they have fight they've gone we have really got to get this back on track and they've absolutely knocked it out of the park it's like this is you know as i said this is very much a film where it goes this is you know the right mix of Bond, the right feel of Bond and and it's very much where Moore starts to, you know, be his own character yeah, it's like, it's not so much you know, okay, it's Connery we, we, we really wanted Sean Connery more in this but it's Connery light, okay to, no, this guy is fun, this guy is a fun person you know, he's, as we've said yeah. you know, James Bond science nerd yeah, and he's a very personal person. He tries to, like, mm -hmm. you know, at least talk to people. Mm -hmm. and But he's also very scientifically aware because um, at the climax of the movie, he's the one, like, reprogramming submarine uh, computers and, you know, sending messages to people. Mm -hmm. And he is, like, he is on the computer keyboard typing away and, like, you know, doing the hacking stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to say hacking because... That's not what he's doing, but, you know, he is doing the technical stuff, and he, he's the one explaining it to everyone else, yeah. and it, he is, he is very, he is a very technically forward one, which, it's like, would you see Sean Connery or Daniel Craig try to reprogram a submarine computer? And the no, answer is no. No, no. And it's very much sort of... It, it does have a lighter touch, and it does have a lighter touch in quite a number of ways. Like, the way this film uses music, for example, is like, we get a disco James Bond film. Mm -hmm. Because you get Martin Hamilich, basically John Barry has buggered off due to tax reasons of all things. And basically does a yeah. disco version of Bond, and it sort of does very strange things with soundtrack. Um, yeah, and it's like at one point we get the score of Lawrence of Arabia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, Lawrence of Arabia. You also get the Doctor Zhivago theme. You have Maurice Jarre, who is this obviously the uh, a uh, French composer uh, who obviously comes in and does a few pieces because obviously he's got nothing better to do. Um, and a fair chunk of classical music, but you also have nobody does it better, which is. Yeah. Again, a really good theme. It's like... Yeah. Which is done by Carly Simon, and it's like, this is really good. Why yeah, is this so good? I don't know. It's it's weird, and it works. Mm. 
it, and it, it captures that sort of again that sort of mixture of light and darkness which i think this film captures perfectly and sort of another random bit of trivia um stanley kubrick worked on this film yeah um they needed somebody to supervise the lighting and um apparently people were talking to people and the director of photography was losing his eyesight mm. at the time so um, they're like, can you have somebody watch this stuff? And like Ken Adam turned to his friend Stanley Kubrick and he's like, all right, I'll do yeah. this under absolute secrecy. secrecy. And yeah. he suggested, uh, and in addition, like hmm. uh, Kubrick's stepdaughter designed the dentures that Richard Keel wears. Hmm. Yeah, and this is shot, uh, This obviously this is for the finale, which is shot on this absolutely colossal, sound stage which is called the W seven stage which is still used to this day. Yeah. Um it is massive. We are talking like a you know, this sound stage is about the size of an aircraft hang. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you get Stanley Kubrick into like the thing and also this type this thing contains like five and a half million litres of water. And so like, oh, this is yeah. really big. Let's let's go get Stanley Kubrick in to do it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it, this movie has a lot of weird uh, trivia yeah. to it. Like, um, this is the last movie Elvis watched before he died. Yeah, <laughs> it's so it's 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 it, it thing is it captures. I, just, I feel this is like this is where more starts to go. Okay, enough of the old guy. Enough of, of sort of Sean Connery's go at this. This is my go at doing both. I'm going to make him this far more interesting. It's actually quite gentlemanly sort of approach compared to like the slightly brutish um, element. I think the Connery's bond, the sort of slightly icy menace that Connery's bond has. Mm. It's like, and this, another thing is this film was nearly directed by Spielberg. <laughs> it's like, yeah. what is Ooh. But he was caught up in extremely lengthy pre-production for a movie called... Jaws. Yeah, and it's like, <laughs> so yeah, it, it's it's fun, it's a fun, fun movie. Yeah. It's it, it's it's extremely entertaining. It is just pie entertainment, which is like the best thing like a James Bond movie mm. can be. Mm. Uh, I mean, obviously, you get the Craig ones that mm. have you know another angle to it, but mm. you know, it's like the stuff that is really. It is consistently really good throughout, and it has mm. incredibly good sets. It has incredibly good locations, and it uses everything, and mm. everything you know, yeah. has momentum. It doesn't feel like they put something there to be popular, and it sticks out from the rest of the movie. Mm. And we'll get to that. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, it does, but, it, it does feel like after two films where they've basically gone, here is the trend, let us chase the trend. It's gone, we're James in Bond. We are the yeah. trend. We are the trend, and we are we are going to make th something that gets copied by everybody else, and a lot of people did, including yeah. James Bond. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, then they learned all the wrong lessons from it, and then went fad chasing again. <laughs> yeah, which is what we'll get on to. Uh, yeah. Tomorrow, because tomorrow we have to deal with Moonraker. <laughs> Moonraker, which uh, you know, I think we'll have an interesting conversation mm -hmm. about it, but I, I it feels weird that it we probably can't have as interesting a conversation with the spy love me because it's just really good it's, go, it's, go watch it's good. it go, go watch go it on. right now go, yeah go, go do that we'll see you tomorrow <laughs>